FOMO. Crisis, however you want to define a crisis, is uh, is always followed by victories, and victories are always followed by crisis. So we cannot, in a sense, be comfortable in either or rejoice in either. So if I'm having victories, I got to know that I can rejoice in it, but it'll be over. Every up is followed by down, down by up. That's the cycle of life, spring, winter, so on and so forth. This cycle will keep continuing, and we just got to be comfortable with it. I'm Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out. And it's why some people end up following the crowd when they should be blazing a trail of their own. But if you want to achieve greatness in business and life, you've got to break free. Come on, I'll show you how. This is FOMO Sapiens, where we explore how entrepreneurial thinkers find the inspiration and the courage to build exceptional lives. Welcome back to FOMO Sapiens, the show for entrepreneurial thinkers. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis. And today, we're going to be talking to Payam Zamani, author of the new book, Crossing the Desert, The Power of Embracing Life's Difficult Journeys. Now, if you don't know Payam, let me tell you a little bit about him. Fascinating guy. He's an entrepreneur, investor, and the founder of One Planet Group, a closely held private equity firm that owns a suite of online tech and media businesses. Born in Iran, Zamani was forced to flee at the age of 16 due to his religious beliefs as a Baha'i. He was offered asylum in the U.S. in 1988, settling in San Francisco, and upon graduating from the University of California, Davis, he and his brother founded AutoWeb, one of the first online car marketplaces, which they took public in 1999. Remember those days? Those were the days. Since then, he has built and currently owns multiple technology and media businesses, and he's invested in more than 50 companies, while striving to redefine capitalism in an attempt to elevate business to serve humanity. Payam, welcome to FOMO Sapiens. Thank you, Patrick. Really excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited too, because everything that you do is stuff that I like to do as well. So we're going to have lots to talk about. Now, before we get there, I always start the show with the same question. And even you, a man who clearly does a lot of good things in the world, cannot escape my question. The question is this. Tell me something unexpected you learned about yourself that changed everything. All right. Uh, this, this is a big question and, and a few things come to, to mind. But I, you know, I'm going to go with something lighthearted. And I know if you change everything, but it changed some stuff. So I have uh, a few good friends, close friends, who love flying. And I kind of always stayed away from it because I was afraid of I wasn't necessarily excited about flying and I was at times afraid of flying. But then about three and a half years ago, I decided that, you know what, I'm going to learn learn how to fly. And I've absolutely loved it, but I've loved it because of the fact that when I fly, particularly by myself, and sometimes I do cross country from New York to San Francisco, when I do that, those are some of the best, um, I guess, alone times that I get to really be away from everything. I don't have Wi-Fi, and I fly a prop plane that takes me two days to go from San Francisco to New York and back, or one way it takes two days. But it gives me a, just an unbelievable meditative opportunity to be by myself, and it's been amazing. It's been amazing, and, and it's, you know, I'm 53, so, you know, learning at this age and making sure that your mind remains fresh is a good thing. And, and you want to have something like that. So it's been pushing me. So I love it. So our former guest, Stephen Collar, learned how to do uh, sort of like freestyle skiing in, the, in, in, in his 50s. And it is true that forcing yourself to learn something new, not forcing, but embarking on a new adventure, yeah. it's really critical to aging, uh, sort of making middle age you know, yeah. a positive experience. Now, what I will say is having, I have a buddy, his name's Pascal, who flew me in a two-seater. He's a like you, he loves to fly from East Hampton to Rhode Island. And every time the wind blew, I was prepared to die. So I, I'm really impressed because, I mean, you're an entrepreneur, so you're a risk taker, but, and, and I know it's safer than it looks, but that it's terrifying. Oh, there, there, there are times that, oh. you know, yeah, I, I love my skills, but I got to pray. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So what I like, so about you 
and we're just meeting, but w- the reason why I was excited to talk to you today is when I opened your book, the first word in the book on the first page was the word optimism. Optimism, period. That's a choice you made. And so I want to start there. Why did you decide to start your book that way? Yeah. You know, it's interesting because, uh, you know, it's easy uh, when you talk to friends, you talk to people that you spend time with, that people almost pride themselves uh, to become cautious, to to be the ones who supposedly are giving you wisdom, that they are they don't view themselves as pessimistic, but they view themselves as the people who see the obstacles, who see the problems. The issue is that, you know, I don't see much value in it. I think that I want to look at those opportunities, those those nuggets of open windows that give us the opportunity to get to the other side. So when I think about my own life, whether it was escaping Iran or, or living as a Baha'i in Iran, escaping Iran, coming to the U.S., not having any money, if it wasn't for optimism, I could have proved myself every single time that the likelihood of me getting to the other side is close to zero. So... I don't want to do that. I don't want to live that. And I think that you experience that in business, in personal life, in all kinds of stuff. So I always tell people, there are no roadblocks. There are obstacles along the way, but there are no roadblocks. So optimism, all that means is that I'm going to find those windows of of openness and I'm going to get to the other side. Yeah. Somebody recently asked me what a perfect day looks like. And I said, a perfect day is waking (laughs) up in the morning um, with, with looking forward to the day that's ahead. Yeah. And that's something that, by the way, like it's not every day because maybe you're <laughs> something bad, you know, you're going in for like a surgery. I don't know. I mean, we all have our challenges in life and things we don't look forward to, but if you can allocate as many days possible with, to a, a, an optimistic and hopeful mindset, we all know that the research shows that that shifts the way that you live your life. That's right. But also I would say that You're right. There are mornings that you get up and it's just not going to be the best day because of a surgery, because of whatever that may be the case. But here's a fact of life. Crisis, however you want to define a crisis, is uh, is always followed by victories and Mm -hmm. victories are always followed by crisis. So we cannot, in a sense, be comfortable in either or rejoice in either. So if I'm having victories, I got to know that I can rejoice in it, but it'll be over. Every yeah. up is followed by down, down by up. That's the cycle of life, spring, winter, so on and so forth. This cycle will keep continuing. Again, we just got to be comfortable with it. So let's move on to your journey as a child, because it's so formative to your, um, I think, to everything you've done and, and, and your journey as an entrepreneur and really, you know, having to leave your homeland where you face persecution, you talk about it in the book, um, for, for, for folks that are listening, just frame that up and how the, the experience of having to flee your country really affected you as a person and, and shaped Mm. how you are today. So, um, it's hard to encompass that whole experience in a few minutes, but mm-hmm. I'll share with you a couple of things. One is that, so uh, uh, the Baha'i faith represent, and, and the followers of the Baha'i faith represent the largest minority group in Iran, religious minority group in Iran, mm-hmm. where almost 99% of the population are not just Muslim, but they're Shiite Muslim. And after the Iranian revolution in 1979, when the clerics, uh, took power, they made life very difficult for Baha'is to the extent that they killed hundreds of Baha'is. They expelled Baha'is from their jobs. And in 1980, as a 10-year-old, I was expelled from school in the worst possible manner, getting bitten up, getting almost killed. So that is, let, let's just put that you know, in one corner. Then now you experience the idea of leaving Iran because of your religion. And you cannot just get a passport because they took your passport away because of your religion. So here are my parents, I'm 16 at the time, and they pay a smuggler to get me to the other side, to Pakistan. Now, the, the scene is, I'm in this border town in Zahedan, which is close to the border of Pakistan and uh, uh, close to the border of Afghanistan. We have just driven 24 hours on a bus uh, through the hottest uh, desert uh, on the planet called the Emptiness Desert. The smuggler has told us, when you get there with your mom, 
don't say goodbye to your mom because people are watching. You could get arrested. So I get off the bus. There's my mom. I don't say goodbye. I go to the road. A car stops and says, get in because the guy has my picture and he knows that he, is ex- he should be expecting me. I get in the car. I look back and through the back window of the car, my eyes just lock in my mom's eyes. And as far as I know, I'm never going to see her again and she'll never going to see me again. But she has no ability to show emotions. I can tell she's crying out loud inside, but she cannot show her emotions. And what I'm thinking is how bad a government has to be that a mother thinks that my son is better off going with a smuggler that by nature should not be trusted, but that's where he will be safer than staying with me in this country. And then, of course, you know, I started that journey of escaping Iran, and that that took many days. And along the way, I thought I may not survive it because of the circumstances that I was stuck in and, and I had to fight through and get through. And then ultimately making it to this country as a refugee uh, and becoming and for a period of time being stateless. But then, you you know, I made it to this country and, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity and the second chance in life that this country offered me. I always tell people the first time in my life that I experienced human rights and I experienced true dignity for my life was when I went to the U.S. Embassy in Pakistan. For the first time ever, I was exposed to a government and a country that actually cared for my well-being. And I don't think most Americans realize that privilege, that that position that America has. I never thought for a moment Russia is going to save me or China is going to save me. But I did think America is going to save me. And that is something that I don't take for granted. And I think that many of us as Americans really, truly appreciate the hope that this country represents to the world. FOMO. FOMO. Yeah, you know, as you say that, I was just thinking about, you know, we live in a time where, unfortunately, your story, we're seeing it more and more today. I mean, the amount mm-hmm. of people who are in, in flux that are refugees in our world and uh to put yourself in people's shoes uh, and to think about their experience and why they're doing what they're doing, you know, it can change a lot of the ways that we see these things. Yeah. And we can we can also recognize, as we know, a lot of people who uh, enter this country as immigrants become leaders in business, build new things because they have nothing to lose. And so unlike many of us who, you know, listen, we all want to, we're ambitious people, but when you have nothing to lose, you may just go well beyond and take risks that other folks yeah. won't. Which is exactly what you did. You come here, 10 years in, later, you with your brother take a company called AutoWeb out public in the heydays, like the pet.com days of the internet. And by the way, Payam, just so you know, I was there for that. I was a baby venture capitalist investing in, we were investors in a company called Star Media, which was another darling of the time that went way up and then, well, didn't sort of end up in the right place. And a lot of companies, right, I remember right. I remember these times, I remember just being like, well, you know, it's kind of like, it reminds me of like Dogecoin or whatever, where like, you know, you had these yeah. huge fortunes being made and you're like, oh my God. So you you were there for that. You were in the front row. Talk about, uh, you know, the experience of living that high of, you know, you were on paper worth mm. $200 million. And then what happened afterwards? <laughs> By the way, you mentioned Pets.com. Julie Wainwright is one of my closest friends, and she's one of the people who's endorsed uh, my book, uh, and I love her. And, uh, you know, she, she's uh, built great businesses. So, yeah, you know, it's just funny that I sometimes feel like, what did I do to deserve to have that front row seat uh, mm-hmm. to this uh, amazing period um, uh, that, that collectively we all went through? You know, you got to keep in mind that I was there. I was the co-founder of AutoWeb, but I did not do it by myself. Not only had a co-founder, but I was fortunate enough to have met so many amazing people along the way in this country that, you know, they had no reason, no need to help me, but they did. And, and I talk about them in my book, and some of them have not heard from me for decades. Mm. But if it wasn't for those people and the kindness that they showed and the mentorship that they showed, I would have never been able to uh, to be at the right place at the right time, but to take advantage of that life moment that I was able to take advantage of. And of course, we took that company public in March of 1999. 
uh, saw the market cap soar to a billion too. And, uh, you know, I remember uh, the next day reading the paper that said AutoWeb worth more than Rolls Royce, which was true. Uh, Rolls Royce mm-hmm. was just sold for $500 million. And uh, so it was an amazing moment. It was an amazing experience. But then soon I also realized the ugly side of capitalism as we practice it in this country. And um, the fact that few billionaires in this country have made money because they have generated billions in cash flow. Most of them have made their money from stock and stock appreciation. And unfortunately, stock appreciation is not always done in an ethical way often uh, but then we had a famous ceo who recently said unethical is not illegal make it illegal so i won't do it and uh, you know the fact is that when i was exposed to that i felt like i'm not sure if i want to be a part of it when i saw that how credit suisse first boston that was the primary bank, uh, book runner for our ipo how they had manipulated things in the background to make sure that what later on i learned that was laddering that you sell the stock for a certain price but you get those buyers to commit in advance that they're going to buy the shares also in open market at a higher price to ensure that the stock price is going to go up, but in an artificial manner. It was disheartening. It was disheartening that the company I was building to become this, uh, to become, uh, you know, create an evolution, revolution, whatever you want to call it in the automotive space that was being played with in that manner uh, by people who are doing financial engineering to take care of in a sense, short-term financial gains without any interest in building a business. So it it was an interesting experience for me. Now, of course, as I talked about in my book, uh, I went on to losing most of that $200 million. But I also tell people that's the best thing that could have happened to me. Uh, I don't know that 27-year-old me, uh, what I would have done uh, with that wealth if if I was able to hold on to it. I wasn't ready for it. So I feel like I needed the time to rebuild and build it the right way, build it in a sustainable way. And as part of that, build it in a way that I feel like is uplifting me and those around me. So uh, so I can look back and with joy, think about the impact. It is, uh, it is not unusual. These things do happen. There are lots of people who live through that experience. And you have a, it's, I don't want to say choice per se, but w- either you sort of learn something or you don't. Either you come out ahead or you come out behind, right? And, you know, oftentimes on on this show, we talk about the concept of post-traumatic growth, which I don't know if you know about it, but it's it's the idea that when bad things happen, you can actually come out ahead because you kind of, you learn what actually matters. You learn, okay, fine, like the sugar high of the IPO, like did that, you know, but... what I really want to do is build something enduring that reflects my values. And like, maybe I won't get the 200 million all on one day, but it's a way more sustainable path physically, mentally for society, all that sort of stuff. And so, you know, that, that's what I think I'm hearing here. You, you've built this, uh, you know, this new, uh, this, this, this follow on, which is one planet group, which, you know, you've done it really mindfully talk about, the business you built and, and the decisions you've made sure. along the way. I mean, going back to the previous subject just for a moment, what happens when a founder in, in the society we live in builds a company and sells it for 200 million or takes it public for a billion? The immediate thing that that founder thinks about is I need to do better now. I need to have a company I can build and sell for more money or I can take it public for a bigger valuation. But why is that? Why is it that there is this concept of more that I need to accumulate more? I need to be able to consume more. And the more capacity I have for consumption, that means I've arrived. That means I'm successful. I don't get that. And, and I feel like I fundamentally fail to understand that if I'm operating Amazon.com, I feel like, you know, I'm worth a couple hundred billion dollars, but unless I make that 300 billion, unless I'm the wealthiest man alive, somehow I have not yet been able to achieve that level of success. So I'm still going to think about how can I become a bigger global dominator, potentially run more Main Street businesses out of business, provide fewer choices to the consumers, because then somehow I have 
satisfy my appetite. I don't get it. And I feel like the world is not better off as a result of it. So I think that we need a fundamental shift. I call it that we have a need for spiritual revolution, evolution, transformation. Why? Because the laws are not going to fix that. I need to get to a point that I feel like, you know what? I don't want to maximize my ability to harm the environment. I don't want to maximize my ability to consume the most I can. I want to see how I can live a life that at the end of it, I'm going to have joy and I'm going to think about that the journey was worthwhile living and I'm going to think that, you know what? The world was slightly better off because I existed. Not just because I built the biggest business, but because I left people happier somehow. So my focus with the business that we have, One Planet Group, is at the highest level, two things. Innovation plus intention. What's my intention every single time you make a decision? Why? Is it just because I maximize my pocketbook or is it because I'm making that decision because somehow I think that's the right decision for for the environment, for the for the ecosystem, for people around me that all in all is going to make all of us better. The second uh, issue is the consequence of that decision, you know, because every decision has a ripple effect. So what is the ripple effect of that decision? Now, keep in mind, I want to make money. I don't want to invest in bad businesses and I don't want to run a business that's not profitable. What, what I've learned is that when those become the core drivers of my motives, of the way that I operate, my business actually becomes very profitable. Why? Who doesn't want to work with a company that has those kinds of factors in mind? Who doesn't want to work in that kind of a company? The longevity of our employees is two, three times of Google, Facebook, and others. Why? Because people want to be there. They want to be in that environment. And we all feel good. We, we think that our existence matters. Um, and so I, I believe that there is a form of capitalism that we are able to participate in that sets aside the archaic way that we should only measure success by maximization of shareholder value. And I think once we do that, we're all better off. I totally agree. And I would add on uh, that it's, it's, I think people who don't, people who don't get this, and there are lots of them, I don't know why, because I don't know if they're like living, you know, sometimes if you just surround yourself by people who are just like you, you know, and you never get exposed to people that are unlike you, you, you fail to miss trends in society. But if you hang out with younger people, they are mission driven. They're looking for organizations that are uh, delivering more than just a paycheck, right? People want to also feel that their work has meaning. And so if you want to get great people to join your business, younger people, especially the most talented uh, you have to you have to be in touch with these things because people just won't stick around. And so that is that's why companies get disrupted all the time is because they they fail to yeah. to to notice these shifts in our society. And uh, and it's an opportunity for any entrepreneur. Before we move on to the lightning round, Payan, because you are uh, an entrepreneur, you know, all the way through, like in your core, in your DNA. If you were, you know, say I'm an, an entrepreneur, I'm coming out of business school or, you know, I'm, I'm working in some industry and I'm like, I want to, you know, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to, I want to do this. And I, I, and I hear what you're saying. This, this notion, you talk about spiritual capitalism, right? I want to, I want to do well. I want to do good. You know, I want to be profitable. Um, you know, I'm not looking to do a nonprofit here. Um, but I do want to do something that I can, you know, go to bed every night and feel like I did, I did a solid for our world. Like, what would be uh, the advice in terms of, from a business perspective, like actually putting that company together? Yeah, great question. So when we invest in companies, uh, we ask the founder to sign a document that's called for the betterment of the world. And we tell them, this is not a contractual obligation. You sign it because of the love you have for humanity. And at its core, it says that take the time to figure out how you're going to make your journey a meaningful one. Because keep in mind, overwhelming majority of startups don't survive. And overwhelming majority of them don't sell or go public for, for, for a meaningful number, which means that you cannot wait till the day that that big thing happens. Live your journey as though this is it. It is a journey that you should make it meaningful. So. What do you have? You have some money, could be a portion of your revenue. 
It's your time, your resources, the expertise, the product you have. And, you know, what are the elements that you can make a part of uh, your core, part of the DNA of your business? And I can give you examples of what we've done at our work. We have committed a sacrificial portion of our revenue for uh, charitable giving. And I believe that as a company, we should not do what many companies do, which is get a check mark. Uh, we don't want to do that. We want to build a company that truly uh, wants to sacrificially give to nonprofit causes, and we adopt a nonprofit that becomes part of us. We don't necessarily think because we're good at one thing, we can also be good at educating the world. So we want to adopt somebody, a company, a nonprofit that's very good at that. We decided that we're going to have service days, that there are days that our employees, they get paid, they're encouraged to offer service on those days. There's one thing we ask them not to do on those days, which is not serve a political party, that by nature, they're divisive. We chose that uh, we're one half 50% of our employees to be female in, a, in, a, in an area that, you know, Google, Facebook, and others, uh, only less than a third of their employees are female, and even they are super young, meaning they're not moms. We wanted to change that, that we, if you're gonna serve humanity, we wanna look like humanity. And I think that for every company, those factors are different, but consider what, are those, what those factors are for your business and put them into the core of who you are. The biggest thing that we put at the core of who we are was that we, we believe that, and I'm a spiritual person, I'm a religious person, I believe that humans are created noble. So if I look at you as a noble being, I'm going to look at you as something beyond an, a, 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 a token of economic value. There's more to you, and I want to serve you. The moment I think about I want to serve you, my relationship with you, whether you are my competitor or my client or my vendor, that's going to change. So I feel like that those are the kinds of things that have to become part of our DNA to help us build better businesses and just be better members of a, of a society. Let's play the long tail. You know the beauty of that for everybody who just heard that master class? I was thinking about um, Patagonia. And uh, I remember reading the business school case when we talked yeah. about it and like that was so edgy at the time. And now I'm like, well, that's, you know, it's worked quite well. Right. But um, yeah, some of the it's, you know, similar kind of concepts. But what's so beautiful about this concept as an entrepreneur is uh, it makes everything easier when you have core values, then the strategy and the decisions you make, you have a lodestar, you have a guide. Against right. which you say some shady deal or something that's kind of in the gray area comes up and you're like, should we do this deal? You know, should we work on this thing? Should we hire this person? Well, you, it's like you have values against which you yeah. can make that decision. And so it just, yeah. it's a lot easier than trying to optimize everything for the marginal dollar. You know, our, our number one core value in the organization is lead with love. Mm. And, um, that's a love you have for the planet, for humanity, and that encompasses, like I said, your competitors too. You have love for everybody. And, you know, it should be unconditional. And uh, the moment I have that, I'm going to think twice that should my success depend on someone else's demise? Really? Like, like do I really want to be that successful, make so much money that I want to see my competitor go bankrupt? If the consumers choose to not work with my competitor, that's one thing. But my competition is also noble being. Mm. I don't want to be here to proactively choose to hurt them, but I'd rather just want to build the best company I can. FOMO. FOMO. All right, let's move on to the lightning round. I got four questions for you. You ready to go? Let's do it. All right, number one. <laughs> What's a favorite quote? Oh, uh, and I always uh, forget who was the guy behind it, but that it, I'm paraphrasing it. Everybody thinks about worthy accomplishments, but few actually get off their couch and do the work. And uh, because, again, you talk to people, they all want it, but I don't want to have entitlement. Got to get out there, put in the hard work and persevere. I think it was Rumi. Let's say Rumi. Feels like Rumi. Let's say Rumi. Sounds good. <laughs> Rumi was kind of Persian, so I'm going to go with that. Exactly. But everybody, you know, it's not a million. Rumi, that's like, that's, he was just writing things all day long. Exactly. All right. Number two, name one book or podcast every FOMO sapiens should know about besides your own. Yeah. The Infinite Game by Simon Sinek. I love that book. Yeah. Fantastic. Love that book as well. Okay. Number three, what is one piece of advice you would give to your younger self? 
uh, get yourself an amazing mentor as soon as you can in life. They help you save so much time, money, resources, headache, pain. So I've been, I, I mean, it's, we, I've talked about this in the show before. I, I was really bad at that. I was like, I didn't like the feeling of, you know, asking feels so vulnerable. Yeah. And then when I got over that, I'll come up to a stranger on the street. Will you be my mentor? And <laughs> once you, once you start doing That's it, awesome. once you rip off that band aid, like you're good to go. Yeah. Uh, finally, uh, what is your most important memory? My, uh, the memory that always is, is just etched in my mind is that goodbye to my mom. Mm. It always gets me emotional to even talk about it. And, um, just thinking about what my mom went through at the moment that I had to say goodbye to his six, her 16 year old son, thinking that she would never see him. Um, as a father, I cannot even imagine being put through that. So, so that, that's the biggest memory that I will carry with me till the end. All right. Thank you. Well, if you want to read more about that and more about, about this incredible story, Payam's incredible story, you can read his new book. It's called Crossing the Desert, The Power of Embracing Life's Difficult Journeys. You can pick up the book and learn more about it at crossingthedesertbook.com. You can find out more about Payam on socials, including on Instagram, where he's got a great, a very nice Instagram, at Payam Zamani. Payam Zamani, author of Crossing the Desert. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Patrick. Really appreciate it. FOMO. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on the web at FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com, where you can get all kinds of free resources to live a more decisive and entrepreneurial life. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. Mm-hmm.